Hello, everyone. Thanks for being here on a Saturday morning. Great to be with you. I'm Amy at MIT Technology Review. So happy to be having this discussion today because this is a topic that everybody wants to know about. Where is artificial intelligence headed next? We think about this all the time in our own coverage. And I can think of no better person to talk about it with, with it today than Jamie here, who is not only an MIT alum earning her PhD in artificial intelligence uh, from MIT, but also comes to us from Microsoft, a company that has invested hugely into OpenAI to the tune of $10 billion just over a year ago, and is now baking OpenAI's large language models into many familiar products and services, including Word, PowerPoint, Outlook, and of course, the new Bing search engine. So uh, with more than a billion uh, users of those products worldwide now, Microsoft is a leading AI company, and perhaps less well-known, but no less important are the company's efforts to develop tools that developers can use to write code and build software faster in collaboration with OpenAI and also GitHub, which Microsoft owns. So Microsoft is all in on AI, and Jamie is here to tell us where this is all headed. Jamie, welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Amy. So I'm curious, as somebody who has been involved in AI for quite some time, dating back at least your, to your time here at MIT, perhaps longer, you know, when did you really realize that these new generative AI models were changing the game and that we were headed into a new era of artificial intelligence? It's a great question, um, because as you say, I've been doing AI for a long time. Um, over when they, I was here when they built the uh, Gary building for the Stata Center. Um, and, um, you know, I actually, my role, so I'm chief scientist at Microsoft, and that role was created essentially to start thinking about how to bring AI into our products. Um, so I've been doing it for a number of years at Microsoft, trying to, trying to think about how it changes work. Um, but I pretty much, I did not think we would be where we were, where we are today in my lifetime, honestly. And it was probably um, about a year and a half ago that I really saw um, where we were. I had been playing around at the time with GPT-3.5, which probably a lot of you are familiar with. That was sort of what was underlying chat GPT and um, thinking about that in our products. And then I went, um, I went and met with Sam Altman, who's CEO of OpenAI and Satya, our CEO at Microsoft, and a few others. Um, and like I went into this meeting and I knew I was responsible for taking GPT-4 and figuring out how to integrate it into our products. Um, and was actually quite skeptical. Uh, you know, there's a, pretty much business leaders get really excited about AI and make these cool envisioning videos about all the places you, Don't <laughs> you say. can, all the things you can do with it. And I knew like the reality of actually taking it. So I go into this meeting and I'm deeply skeptical. I'm like, okay, I, I'm gonna figure this out, but I kind of thought I was set up to fail. And so like I'm sitting there with my arms crossed and like, let's see. And uh, Greg Brockman um, started doing, um, you know, doing some demos. And I'm like, these are, actually, they were really cool, but you see great demos. So I was like, um, okay. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I know the right questions to ask and how to break the model. And it was really cool to sit there, like, iterating with the model and seeing the way that it main con maintained context and the way that it was able to handle ambiguity and sort of deal with conflicting constraints in a really nuanced way. Um, and I, I would say, I like... I like that was a switch mm. in time and you know and, and in fact I only live a couple miles from campus and I was driving home and I couldn't even make it from campus home because I was so overwhelmed I had to like pull my car over into the 7-eleven parking lot <laughs> and I sat there and I screamed like I literally screamed wow <laughs> <laughs> it really um, hit you yeah no it did I mean I felt like I realized that this wasn't this wasn't a, like a challenge that I had. It was a gift. Like it was a real like I felt this huge responsibility to take this technology and get it into people's hands and to do it in the right way. Um, yeah, that's fascinating to hear. It surprised you so much as somebody who with so much experience in the field. So that was about 15 months ago or so. Uh, catch us up. You know what has changed? Can you kind of just describe this moment in AI for us today? What has changed in that time since you first had that realization? Yeah, well, so that began a sprint for us to figure out how to bring these language models to people. And probably the big thing is the ecosystem that's bu being built up around the models is really changing. Um, so, 
you know, you can have an amazing model, but you need to be able to serve it up, so, you know, to do the inference. So you need the infrastructure to, to um, you know, do all, all the compute necessary to do that inference. You need it to work in multiple languages. You need it to be up at all the time. And then you need the sort of surrounding infrastructure to make sure it's behaving in a responsible way. You need to um, have integration with people's uh, personal data in a privacy preserving and compliant way. So how you can bring in, because the models are really good at reasoning, um, but they need to be grounded in data. And often that data is quite personal private data. So how do you take your personal emails or your personal documents and like bring that information into the model in a way um, that, that is trustworthy? Uh, and then they actually need to be integrated into people's workflows and like built into the products and the applications. And so like that, that has been, um, you know, there's obviously a lot of work continuing to go on the models and as surprising as the jump from GPT-3.5 to 4 has been, we can expect to see um, big jumps like that moving forward, but uh, this rich ecosystem in which the model operates is also really important. So Microsoft obviously building software that people are using at work, and I know that you also lead the company's Future of Work initiative. So I want to ask you a question a lot of people have been wondering, which is how do you think AI will change the way that we work moving forward? Good question. Um, so I think there's sort of two ways. There's like the short term and then there's the long term. In the short term, there's things that these large language models are particularly good at. Um, and we're going to see that um, show up. So like they're great at summarization, they're great at content creation, and that's the early places they're showing up in our applications as well. So like you want to write an email, uh, we can help you generate content to reply to an email or start a new document. So you sort of don't have this blank, uh, blank page challenge anymore. Uh, you also get a lot of content to consume, and so it can help you summarize a meeting transcript or something you've seen. And for these kinds of tasks, it's amazing. Uh, so we do all sorts of studies. We've got telemetry data, we're doing uh, controlled lab studies, we run surveys, and um, we find across these sort of tasks that you expect the model to be doing well, people are faster. You see maybe um, like across search and summarization and creation, people are 29% faster while quality remains relatively consistent. Uh, you see people are feeling more efficient. They, you know, um, are enjoying work more. So you see all these sorts of really obvious kinds of... Imagine that. <laughs> no, it's, I mean, it's kind of delightful, too, to come up with new ideas. But, like, the real opportunity... So that's in the short term. Like, yes, it's going to make us more efficient and better at the things that we do. Um, but the real opportunity is the stuff that we kind of haven't yet seen in the way. You know, so, like, I'm, I'm sure you've all kind of joked about this, like, oh, great, I'm going to use AI to write an email to send it to Amy, and then Amy's going to use AI to read my email. <laughs> and, like, that's sort of, that's an example of what goes wrong in the short term as we're, as we're using AI to do the tasks that we currently do. Um, and, like, I think in addition to augmenting our current activity, what we're going to see is a lot of innovation so that it fundamentally changes the way that I might write an email to Amy, you know? <laughs> Yeah, there was some really interesting research out of the MIT economics uh, department here last year uh, that showed with the writing task, ChatGPT made all workers more productive, but it made the least skilled workers much more productive. And so if you're already a pretty good writer, it might not help you as much, but if you're not a strong writer, it could help you a lot and even help you produce work on the level of somebody who is a much stronger writer than you, which is really cool. Um, so, but how do, you, how do you see that changing the workforce? How do you think that will play out? Yeah, and that's a really consistent finding. So, so um, that study was one of the first to come out. But yeah, um, I know that BCG, it seems like, is BCG, MIT, and HBS did some work that found similar things. We found similar things as well. That's like low skilled uh, workers are doing well. So that's a really interesting um, thing. You know, actually, code is a fascinating place where that plays out too. You know, that nat that coding becomes as easy as using natural language means that we can start like automating stuff we do with, through our language or figuring out how to explain to the computer. It's that handling of ambiguity that I was talking about, um, where code is very non-ambiguous and, and the ability to translate ambiguous natural language into code um, is cool. Uh, so I think that is why innovation is so important. In many ways, we're going to get all this extra time. We're going to be able to do the things that we were 
kind of knew about and were expecting. And um, actually, I put it on all of you to figure out how are we going to use that extra time? How are we going to, you know, like when every student can be a, you know, B plus, A minus student just by using uh, GPT-4, like what does that mean to build on top of that? Well, I'm curious as somebody who's building tools for other people to use at work, kind of a meta question, but how are you using these tools yourself? What have you found them most useful for in your own work or personal life? I think that the tools are particularly useful actually not for these sort of efficiency gains in as much as um, for the provocations they can provide. Um, so I really like the way the model um, helps me see other perspectives really quickly, helps me ideate and think through new things. Um, so for example, I talked about the, um, you know, so like seeing GPT-4 and then going to figure out how to integrate it into the products. Um, in those really early days, the model, like so, uh, GP, chat GPT hadn't been released. GPT-4 was was very tented, so we were keeping it very plain, it very close to the um, the hand close to our chest, and only a few people at Microsoft had access to the model. And so I, I had access to the model, but I had a whole team of people who were building it into Word and Outlook and Teams. Um, and they, you can't do that without seeing the model, particularly because the things it could do were so unexpected. And so we would all get together on a call. And I would sit and you know run things. And people would be like, ooh, will you try this? Will you try that? And we'd try different things and run it through. But actually, the fascinating thing was that collaborative process of yeah. using the model as was really valuable as a team. So like somebody would come in and be like, oh wait, let's let's give it a personality, you know. And this is where we started figuring out how to build the meta prompt. Uh, for the system, and then somebody else would come in and be like, okay, like let's try and pull in uh, some profile information, and we start exploring how we might do personalization, and everybody gets to watch and see that, and then sort of build from it. So somebody in Outlook is exploring how you might pull calendar information in to help support the reasoning, and everybody gets to see that in Teams and in Word and start learning from it. Um, so I think that that ability to um, sort of see things in new ways and the way that it supports um, brainstorming and collaboration. I want to ask you about the future of search, a topic I'm very interested in as a journalist who cares a lot about how people find information online. Uh, how do you think these generative AI tools will change the way we navigate the internet? And are there any early signs that you're seeing from the new Bing search engine about patterns, ways people are using it that you can share with us? Yeah, I mean, that's a topic that's near and dear to my heart as well. My PhD was actually in uh, personalized search, so so I I love it. I my my application essay was about how I wanted to turn the internet into an oracle um, for all knowledge. Uh, I didn't think that we'd we'd have done <laughs> done <Bold>. that. So <laughs> I thought I was bolder than I was. Uh, um, yeah, no, it's amazing to think about um, how to integrate. Uh, search. Actually, a lot of the work I was doing was like I was interested in personalization. I was interested in refining. I was, did a lot of the early learning to rank work. Um, and, you know, one of the things that we really saw, so search engines had all these kind of constraints on them. You know, it, if you get a search result even uh, delayed 100 milliseconds, so people can't perceive 100 milliseconds. It's just a tiny fraction of a time. But if search results are 100 milliseconds slower, you actually think the results are worse. And you click on less content, you come back to the search engine less. So search engines have had this real strong optimization to get really fast. Um, and so I actually got very curious about like what does it mean if we're going to do personalization or start doing more complex things, um, and started building in, um, this concept of slow search and how you would how you would come back to things. Um, and it's fascinating right now when you think about it. But the challenge was you had to have something that really made that extra time worthwhile. And now we have these really powerful tools um, that can start doing more of this reasoning, and you see people using them to do more complex tasks. We're not, we're, we're, we're in many ways, like search, search is just a, a part of the larger task that you're doing and you're seeing people go to search engines to do those larger tasks, to think things through, to get feedback, to create new content. Um, 
Well, Google has dominated this space for so long, and I think Microsoft hoped that by injecting some AI into Bing, it would help people come back to Bing or maybe discover Bing for the first time. So how is that going? Are more people using Bing now? Um, no, 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 no. The reason I'm the reason I'm pausing is because I don't I like it is amazing that there are great search engines out there, and and that is good. In many ways, I think what we what we really think we're doing is creating something that's different. Like it's a new category, it's a new experience. What does it like? Yes, it is search, but exactly as I was saying, it's it's creation, it's reasoning, it's thinking things through. So. You know, in many ways, if we're still talking about search and thinking about search, we're thinking in an old fashioned way. And like the thing, th this is a new thing that's coming for us. So like, that's what I would push on is this yeah. new category. Interesting. Uh, what do you think are the biggest misconceptions out there about artificial intelligence? What are we still getting wrong about this technology? Um, I don't think we're being imaginative enough, um, and, and I've kind of been hitting on that a little bit. I think we need to be, we thinking, we're thinking about how it's gonna help us do our tasks better. We're not thinking about how it's gonna help us collaborate and work together. Um, we're, uh, we're thinking about how it can do stuff that we know more efficiently and faster. We're not thinking about how it can help us do new things or think of things in, uh, in new ways. Um, I think, uh, I think people are used to, and like if you haven't played with GPT-4, like the jump between three, five, and four is really significant and you should. And a lot of people haven't and like don't, like I think we think of it doing simple things and this ability to like serve as a provocateur or to, you know, is, is, uh, is the real opportunity. So make sure that you have current view of what AI can do too. Um. Yeah, what are some of the big challenges you're running into now as you try to integrate AI into all these different Office products and Microsoft products? What are the, what the biggest, most interesting problems you're up against at this moment in the next few months for your work? Yeah, you know, one big challenge is, is actually exactly that, that people um, don't understand the whole range of possibilities. And, like, it's not their fault because the, because it's changing, like, and so it's very hard to be creating something that is evolving as it's being used and that people are learning how they use it. It's a real socio-technical problem, actually, where the, te the you know, the human, hum pe the way people are using the technology is going to shape the way that it evolves. And like that technology is going to shape the way that we do it. And like, how do we get that to go in a successful direction? Like, that's really hard. Yeah, that's so interesting. Uh, well, we've just got a few minutes left here. I do want to ask you if you could make a prediction for us about what the next few months in AI might hold. I know, um, tricky question. Uh, but yeah, what are there any trends or major developments that you expect to see or that we should all be watching for in, say, the next six months? That's funny. And I and I laugh about the next few months, but honestly, like, the things are moving so fast that, like, next they might as well be forever, you know? <laughs> so um, I actually, I guess if... Just to make a concrete prediction, um, I think we're going to start seeing language models ask us questions. So in, in many ways, um, right now, we the models are very human driven and we will sit and say, but like that ability to like pull out more knowledge from people and figure out what's in your head and help you bring more, more to the table is feels like a real opportunity. That's exciting. Okay, last question. Uh, we have a lot of people here in the room today who are perhaps starting out in the field of AI. Do you have any advice for folks for navigating a career in a very fast moving, fast changing space? Um, you all have a, have a hard job ahead of you and an important job. Um, we're essentially tasked with figuring out something entirely new. And, um, you know, there is a model for that. Uh, that is science. Like, that is science is about discovering and inventing new things. Um, so I guess I would encourage you to lead like scientists. Um, and that, of course, means developing hypotheses and met success metrics and, like, iterating and testing things out. Um, 
Uh, but the scientific process contains a lot more. Uh, it also means reading broadly and building on the state of the art. Things are changing. You cannot in just do things yourself. You have to know what's happening out in the world. Um, it also means publishing, sharing your work so that others can build on it. And actually, not just so others can build on it, uh, actually explicitly for verification so that you don't live in your own bubble. Like that's the main, the peer review process is a fundamental part of science so that people can challenge your work. Um, uh, and, it, and it means considering the externalities and the long-term effects of what you're doing as well. That's great advice. Thank you so much, Jamie. Really appreciate this. And uh, thanks for the great conversation. Thank you. Thank you.